So one Sunday morning in Australia, a Sunday school teacher stood before her class of five-year-olds and asked them this question. Boys and girls, who can tell me what is gray and furry and lives in a gum tree? And the students were quiet. So she said, come on, you know what is gray and furry and lives in a gum tree and has a black leathery nose and, and big beady eyes. And still the teacher was met with silence. So she patiently prodded them a little more. Certainly you know it. It lives in a gum tree and eats gum leaves and has big furry ears. And just then a, a little girl in the, the class raised her hand and said, Well, I know the answer is Jesus, but it sure sounds like a koala bear. That's little girl nailed it. Friends, it is all about Jesus. Everything in my life, everything in your life, everything in the church, everything in scripture, everything in heaven, everything in the entire cosmos, everything is all about Jesus. To this congregation in Colossa, a small church, a new church in a town that had been, but now is kind of backwater podunk. To these believers that Paul had never met, but they were under spiritual attack by false teachers, Paul writes them the book of Colossians. And to this young congregation, he holds up Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And just look at what Paul has taught about Jesus in just the first chapter and five verses. He said, Jesus has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into his kingdom. Jesus has given us redemption, forgiveness of sins. He's the creator of all things. He's the sustainer of all things. He's the head of the church. All the fullness of the deity is in Jesus. He has reconciled all things to himself. He has made peace by his blood on the cross. And this Christ is actually in you. And it's in his power that we toil as his church. It is him alone that we proclaim. The goal, Paul says, for every Christian on earth is maturity in Jesus Christ. And if you want wisdom and understanding it is all in him. This is just in the first chapter and five verses. It's all about Jesus, isn't it? And do you think that suddenly in chapter 2, verse 6, Paul's done talking then about Jesus, that he's already given us enough? Not a chance. <laughs> Let's take a look. Look at how he continues in verse 6. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in him. For you've been rooted in him and built up in him and established in him the faith. See, with Paul, believing and behaving 
go hand in hand. As you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord, the believing, walk in him every day of your life. That's the behaving. And notice how this is even possible. In verse 7, we have three passive verbs. Passive verbs in the Bible means that God has already done it. So this is how God has already been at work in their lives and your lives. You've been rooted in Christ. God did that to you. He built you up in Christ. And it is God who established you in the faith. And that is how each and every day we can walk in Christ because it's all about Him. And this is so important to realize that we have already been founded and grounded in Jesus Christ because there is a serious threat in verse 8. Paul continues... See to it that no one in this world, that nothing in this world takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception because those come from human tradition. They are not according to Jesus Christ. The word there, take you captive. In Greek, that word means plundering the cargo of a ship. So Paul is saying, because you've been rooted in Jesus, because you've been built up in Jesus, because God has established you already in the faith, don't let any false teacher or any false teaching take you as spiritual booty and carry you off from truth into error. And so in our day, When I read these words of Paul, this warning about philosophy and empty deceit that are rooted in man, I think of the current mainstream culture that is battering up against the church and its teachings. And Paul is warning, no matter how popular a philosophy or teaching is becoming or how promoted or how even positive it might seem on the outside. Do not let yourselves be carried off like spiritual plunder because it's not from Jesus Christ. The source from these mainstream currents against the church are always man. And so as the church every day, we face this spiritual battle for our minds. It is all over today, all out there. Paul wants us to know in the next verses that we are very well resourced in Jesus Christ to withstand these philosophies and empty deceits. Just starting at verse 10, Paul now launches on more of how it's all about Jesus. This whole string of in him and by him and with hims are true of your life right now. Paul starts in verse 10. You can look at it. You've been made full in him. Meaning you have everything you need spiritually in Jesus Christ. You don't have to look for some other supplement from this media or world. You don't have to look for any other substitute. You've already been made full. You have all you need in him for this world and the next. You were circumcised by Christ. Now, not a circumcision, Paul says, of the flesh, but you were circumcised by Jesus Christ when he worked a clean heart in here. When did Jesus circumcise you? When did he give you a clean heart? Look at verse 12 there. 
Jesus did that when you were buried with him in baptism. In holy baptism, just as we had with Jackson a few minutes ago, you were buried with Jesus Christ in these waters. If you were buried, it means you also died <laughs> in these waters. But just as you were die, just as you were buried, what did Jesus do on Easter? He rose. So look at what Paul says. You were also raised up with Jesus Christ to new life in Him through your faith. So that all of you, Paul writes, who were once dead in your sins, who were flatlined against God, heathens, with no way to save yourselves, what did God do in you? He made you alive with Jesus Christ, having completely forgiven all your sins. See, your baptismal union in Jesus Christ means all the way. So that everything that is true of Jesus Christ, death, burial, resurrection, is now true of you. I want to paint a picture in your mind now. I want you to imagine in your mind, again, put the picture there, that you are in heaven and you are standing before the throne of God. And as you stand before the throne of God, you notice that behind God is a massive filing cabinet system. The filing cabinets are as high as your eye can see and as far to the left and to the right as you can see. And you notice, looking closer, that on the front door of every filing drawer, there is a person's name etched on it. And in this throne room with the massive filing system and God, you notice that Satan is right there too. And Satan is right there pleading with God to open the drawer that has your name on it. Satan is saying, open that drawer because written inside on note cards is a note card for every single sin that you have ever done. Every lust, every fornication, every greed, every covetousness, every putting anything in anyone before God, every lie, every falsehood, every slander, every swear word, note card after note card after note card. Satan is pleading, open their drawer, open their drawer. And so Jesus goes over to the drawer with your name on it. And Jesus starts to pull it open. And not only have all of the note cards been washed in white, but all of the note cards are gone. Every single one. Your drawer is empty. There is no written record or charge or accusation against you. This is a true story. Nonfiction. Look at verse 14. Here's what God has done for you. Having canceled the handwritten record of debt that stood against you and me. That record God has taken away, nailing it to the cross. God didn't just delete that handwritten record of debt that stood against it. God even destroyed the document when he nailed it to the cross of Jesus Christ and God left it there. So Satan and all of his forces have nothing in their hands against any of God's children 
anymore. A victory of this magnitude deserves a parade. And that's exactly where Paul leaves us in verse 15. He, God, in the act of the cross, disarmed the rulers and authorities. He's talking all the demonic realm. He's disarmed them and made a spectacle of them by triumphing over them in Christ. That word, making a public spectacle, is actually a Roman military word. Remember that as Paul is writing Colossians, he's likely in a Roman prison in Rome, right? In Rome, when their army would defeat another army, the Romans would take the defeated king and all of his warriors. They would remove their armor, they would remove their weapons, and they would parade the defeated army and king through the streets of Rome making a mockery and public spectacle of them and showing off all of their plunder. It's the same word that Paul uses here in the cross of Jesus Christ. When he took all of your record and my record and nailed it to the cross, God had a parade. And all of Satan's forces, empty-handed now against us, God paraded on heaven's streets and made a public spectacle of them because Jesus Christ won. And so that Jesus and his cross is always God's amen. Amen.